Poi io ho capito Marco, tu inviti il sindaco e io invito... Benissimo, stiamo come al solito nel Mediterraneo, anche se Vignola un po' di confine e la classica mezz'oretta ce la siamo già mangiata e va bene così, era tutto previsto. Abbiamo alcuni saluti del, di, di, del nostro ospite che è il sindaco di Vignola, poi ci sarà a seguire Duccio Campagnoli, presidente di Bologna Fiere e poi eh, la Ciaraclia eh, Minotu che è il presidente di IFO Mediterraneo e eh, il direttore di IFO Mondiale Marcus Arbenz. Eh, il primo a cui dia... ecco, intanto mi presento Antonio Compagnoni ma mi conoscete penso tutti il eh, mio co-moderatore ecco adesso io smetto di parlare in italiano I will start speaking English because so uh, uh, Ario will speak in Italian I will speak in English uh. eh, Buongiorno io sono Ario Ricchi sono l'assessore all'ambiente e all'agricoltura del comune di Vignola eh, ripeto i saluti che ho fatto ieri eh, perché la platea è cambiata the audience has changed partially today with respect to yesterday so basically I will say the same things I'm extremely happy to see here so many people and specifically to have here a high flying panel of experts and we strongly wanted this event and last year we took office as new city government and one of the very first things I started doing was trying again together with Antonio Compagnoni to get together once again all the experts in this sector and so many years ago we did the same thing in this very same castle so I really did my best to make Agri Bio Mediterranean to come back to Vignola to reactivate uh, after such a long time the exchange, cooperation and and a dialogue between and among so many players, not only within the framework and the Mediterranean, but also beyond its borders. As we saw yesterday, and we had a really interesting pre-conference, we know that there is a, a high level of interest at international level when it comes to these topics. So, first of all, I would like to call on stage Mauro Smeraldi, the mayor, who is going to welcome all of you to this conference. So, Mauro, the floor is yours. First of all, I need to make a clarification. And I must confess that I really like these topics, but because of my role, I'm used to say always the same which are things. But today, I would like to do something different and say something else. In the 80s, there was a bishop in Rome Don Giovanni Franzoni, a Dominican monk, who wrote several books. One was entitled The Land of God. And uh, in this text, he wrote that the earth doesn't belong to anybody. So we inherited of the earth as people of this planet, but our task is simply to make the best of it and respect it and use it just for our subsistence, literally. And then, some time ago, when a specific referendum on water management was carried out, I remember an article published by an Italian journalist, maybe Gramellini or somebody else, who stemmed from the remarks of a sort of Indian native master who said that it was unthinkable to him to sort of 
give his lands to the white occupants. And so these uh, American Indians said that the land was theirs and it was unthinkable for them to give it, to pass it on, and uh, to hand it over to somebody else. And so the journalist then drew on that to develop a specific argument about water. As you probably remember, there was a very important referendum on water management. Unfortunately, the outcome was not fully complied with by our politicians. and uh, so water as a public resource was partially sold to private sort of companies and now maybe the same is going to be done with air but nevertheless yesterday in the main square we had a very interesting meeting with uh, professor Altieri and together with uh, Luigi Ponti from Enea well they wrote a very interesting book called uh, Agroecologia, Agroecology, and Ponti said that uh, sometimes uh, a lot uh, of confusion was made, so it's not that we need to produce more to feed the world. This is not really like that. Actually, our current production is already enough. We only need to better distribute it all over the world. So it's just a matter of resource distribution. And then Giuseppe Di Francesco. And I remember his speech yesterday talked about migrants who had to leave their lands and who have come here also in Italy to die to pick tomatoes. Well, I think there is a fil rouge and sometimes we tend to forget it. So we should try to reach a different development model. I say so because I think that IAB and Agro Bio Mediterraneo need to be heavily thanked for this conference. First of all, because this conference is not only very useful to focus on technical issues, and you are the expert, I'm not, but also to remind ourselves of these topics. And I think that the whole organic world has an interest in that. Thank you very much indeed to be here, and thank you for choosing Vignola as a sort of venue for this conference. So this is a great honor for us. And also, thank you for choosing sort of Vignola as an sort of official venue for this event for another three years. And I would also like to thank uh, Simona Caselli, regional councillor, who is about to arrive. And uh, she is very aware of the importance of organic farming and its development. Fortunately, we now have the right people when it comes to institutions, so the right interlocutors seem to be there now. And when you can talk to the right people, it's a great sort of luck. And I think that Simona Caselli is certainly a reputed interlocutor, especially for the organic sector. So I'm very happy that she's about to join us. Thank you very much and I wish you a fruitful conference day. Non mi ricordo che Paolo Caramolla è arrivato, quindi lo chiamo qui eh, come presidente di Federbio, Federazione Nazionale di Agricoltura Biologica. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I'm also very excited to be here again. And uh, I joined uh, a bit after the 90s. I've been working here for a long time, so I remember very well the billboard of the 
1990 conference. I'm a representative of the organic 2.0 community, so I had to face the big boom of the organic world, especially in Europe since 1991. And now, in Vignola too, we are strongly committed to organic. And uh, together with Bologna Fiere and the Expo, we have been working a lot in order to promote the Italian organic sector. We promoted a forum and uh, the action network of the organic world uh, at the Expo. So, IAB and a Bio TN Biodynamic Association and many others. And so, together with IFOM, we are trying to design the 3.0 organic sector. So, again, we are going through a phase of change, especially in the beginning, in the first years, the beginning of the 90s, we first had to consolidate organic, also from a legal point of view. And now, probably, it's time to become protagonists. And uh, the main topic of Expo is to feed in the world. And uh, at SANA, from Saturday on, we're going to further debate about the future of organic. And as the mayor said, this is not simply about producing more, producing more food. It is about trying to imagine a food model First of all, allowing us to feed the world, because actually our planet now is under threat by several man-made activities, and also we need to provide good food to current and future generations. And we are convinced, otherwise we would not be here, that uh, certainly the knowledge, know-how, professionalism and skills that they have been developed over the years allow us to say now out loud that the that organic is the solution, the most effective and efficient solution to take up this challenge. And as you clearly understand, and as Ephraim said last year, uh, sorry, last week at Expo, we need now to understand uh, how to move from 1% of world agriculture to a larger shares of organic farming. So we know that in some countries, organic farming is more widespread, so we need to go that way and try to promote organic farming all over the world. So this conference uh, I hope uh, won't stop with the end uh, of uh, the uh, last uh, sort of day. And I hope that the dialogue started by Vandana Shiva at Expo will continue. Of course, uh, first of all, we need to build on what is being done now, and uh, we need to keep uh, talking with uh, all the relevant stakeholders to make uh, organic more and more present all over the world, especially when it comes to the future of this planet. I wish you a fruitful meeting, and I hope to hear very interesting speeches and contributions. Thank you very much. And now it's time to listen to Duccio Campagnoli, the president of Bologna Fiere, to the Bologna Fairground Company. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for inviting me. Thanks to Dr. Compagnoni, to Mr. Compagnoni, and to the organizers for inviting me here today. And, uh, of course, I would also like to greet and welcome all of your guests. We are very honored as Bologna Fiere to be here and to be invited to join your conference in a specific moment celebrating the 25th anniversary of your activity. I do believe that our only organic merit, allow me to say, is that Bologna Fiere, as you know, has been organizing for 27 years uh, SANA. So the specific trade show 
rolled out in Bologna and devoted to also the organic world. So Sana was a brave adventure that we started many years ago. At that time, not many people believed in us, and not many decided to join us in this venture. And I remember that we started promoting organic at that time. And uh, another little bio merit, organic merit, is that you really try to do the most to promote organic in Italy together with the irrelevant association. So we tried to do our best to sort of uh, turn the organic farming in something bigger, something well known. And uh, Sana grew over the years. And uh, so Sana is like a yearly expo that takes place every year in Italy about these topics. So again, of course, we are also very happy of the expo in Milan that chose Feeding the Planet as key topic. If you have a look at the chronology, so when the agro Mediterranean, the Bio Mediterranean Forum was born, well, if we have a look back, we can clearly state that Sanad was established two years after that. Somehow stems from that initiative, from the Agri Bio Mediterranean Forum. So thank you very much for doing what you did. So 27 years after, thank you very much indeed. And uh, as Dr. Compagnoni also said, for those of us who try always to look ahead, a philosopher used to say that philosophy is like a trade show, and this is a good definition for those of us that work in trade shows. So the trade show is always useful, but sometimes when you see that what you're doing, I mean, seems to somehow result in a bigger movement, in something bigger, you really feel like doing something useful and meaningful for the community. So thank you for being there, because if Sana is still there, it's also thanks to you. And as I said, uh, we try to sort of bring a piece of organic to the expo. Expo is a very sort of uh, rich showcase, full of colors and sounds. And uh, after four months, so we can say that thanks to the work and commitment and engagement of the National Organic Associations that we tried to support, well, finally, this presence is starting to stand out a bit in spite of the big noise there. To us, this has been a great honor also thanks to the support of IFOM to have a few days ago at Expo IFOM World with the Marcus Arbenz, whom I would like to thank again. And also we had other reputable guests, uh, Harry Clayum. I'm trying to uh, pronounce names properly, Harry Clayam in the two, and uh, together with the Nuremberg trade shows, we tried to set up uh, a good event uh, together with other key players. And so, again, this is another important relationship. And so, we rolled out this organic week aimed, as uh, Paolo Carnemola said to reach a specific result. And of course, we hope to captivate many people's attention. So we do hope that at the end of the Expo, initiatives will be sort of uh, 
dicano taken and I know that this is important then to make headway and progress because otherwise we just stick to nice words as uh, Paolo said Vandana Shiva accepted our invitation to be an official party for the biodiversity and thanks to her charisma, intelligence and smile she was able to convince the gentleman of Expo when she entered the Expo our biodiversity park so was not far from the Coke pavilion however Vandana Shiva fixed the situation because she walked past it together with the expo managers. She looked at it, she took a snap of it, she smiled a lot, she laughed, and then she laughed and smiled and took a snap of our park, and she would say that a biodiversity park was much better than the Coke Pavilion. So somehow she tried to make up things that way and to fix the situation that way. Right, Sana opens up officially tomorrow. And uh, ideally, you are all invited, but I know that tomorrow morning you still have the conference here. And as Paolo said, tomorrow, the minister will officially present at SANA the new plan for the development of the organic sector in Italy. So much remains to be done, and I would like to end up with a wish and a proposal. We're very honored that during the second day of SANA, there's going to be the final session of your conference, of your agro Mediterraneo conference, and we do think that this is extremely important, and God knows to what extent uh, how much this is important also for the tragic events we're going through in Italy, in Europe, and in, Medita in the Mediterranean in general. So, God only knows to what extent it is important to talk about welcoming, solidarity, empathy, support, brotherhood. These are not just empty rhetoric words, but should be real words, authentic concepts. So we need to sort of rediscover our common values and grounds, and certainly farming is a founding value of our country and of Europe. So our hope is to keep on working with your forum also in the future, because we would really like to devote the next editions of SANA to specific uh, sort of sessions about a new bio-Mediterranean farming. Thank you very much, and I wish you fruitful work. Thank you very much, Duccio. We signed an agreement for three years at the Secretariat in Informaggio Mediterraneo with SANA and the Fiera di Bologna that will, uh, I think, really be functional for the development of organic farming, not only here. Uh, Bologna and Vignola are a crossroad, in a way. We have even a, an old ancient way for the pilgrims that going to Rome, they were going different ways. One part of this was passing here, the Via Romea Nonantolana, because Nonantola after Cluny was the, the second abbey in the medieval world. And that road I discovered it brings to Nuremberg. <laughs> so Biofac and Sana are connected through Vignola. But I think also it's important to say Sana has been functional for developing the style of, it's not only trade, but it's also information education to the public. And I think this kind of activities, we need to do it all over the Mediterranean, to increase local production and local consumption, because that is extremely important, not only trade uh, 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 across the Alps, but also in the region. Um, my pleasure to invite on the stage my president, 
Heraklia Minotu of I4 Market Bimeritana. Good morning to everybody. It is a pleasure to be here. And um, I want to firstly thank uh, uh, the municipality of Vignola because uh, we are here. And uh, it's really important that after 25 years, Agribio Agri Mediterraneo is at the same place and uh, will restart with a new vision for the future. At the same time, it is important to thank, uh, to give a big thank you to Bologna Fiera because, uh, and uh, Sana because uh, they hug us and they will support us, as already Mr. Compagnoni mentioned, for the next uh, three years. So it is really important that uh, the Mediterranean and Agribio Mediterraneo will be active in a really, let's say, organic country as Italy. Um, I want, I want also to thank, uh, to give a big thanks to Mrs. Migliorini, who has done all the scientific work, and Mr. Compagnoni, who ran and has the vision and the inspiration to be all of us here. But why we are here today, just to participate in a conference, an international conference about organic, organic agriculture, agroecology, and uh, let's say to restart thinking in the future, a future uh, which combines and uh, includes uh, different parameters and sectors as uh, the sustainability, the biodiversity, the environment, and for sure in three different levels as social, economic, and, um, and environmental priorities. Uh, for us, it is really important as Agribio Mediterraneo to mention that organic agriculture is not only a vision, it's part of our life. We believe in that, we follow that, and um, it is important to mention that uh, the scientific um, uh, works and the results we have from the university and the researchers, but uh, also uh, the experience and the exchange of know-how that will take place these days uh, in this um, area in the frame of the conference will be really important uh, just to networking and work together. The participation of all of us is, uh, let's say, more than um, uh, virtual, just to go on and um, start a new strategy. And uh, we are here just to work with all of you together. Thank you. Uh, before, uh, before calling in uh, the last of the official, I want just to say hello to Armando. Ciao, Armando. <laughs> uh, Armando Mariano, that was the president of IAP, the first one, and that was here in 1990, che era qua nel 90 ed è tornato. Grazie mille, Armando. Mi apri il cuore. <laughs> Bene, chiamo, chiamo ora Marcus Now, Arbenz. I call on stage Marcus Arbenz, please. Grazie. Direttore di IFO. Sei di IFO, I'm director. In Organics International. Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, thank you very much, Hariklia. Also, for all your word of thanks, so I don't need to repeat them. I just would like to heartfeltly join them. And I would like to thank you um, also all of you have, uh, have found a way here and are par participate. A warm welcome on behalf of IFOM Organics International. Actually, um, IFOM Agribio Mediterraneo is the first of our self-organized structure and has been funded 25 years ago. And in that sense, actually, it's also something new for us. The first time we are uh, in the, in the position to celebrate a 25 years anniversary. Happy birthday, uh, I from Agrobio Mediterranean. We came together actually to celebrate the 25 years, but we also came together to celebrate our community, to get inspired and to join, to hook on the latest development and to get energized for, our, for pursuing our organic visions. I stood here last time in front of you in 2011 in Greece when we were host of Harikla, but since then the organic movement has moved. 
yet moved actually to what we call nowadays organic 3.0 or 3.0. In 1919, we were the first, you were the first one to join that group, I mentioned it already. In 19, 2011, we had nine of these self-organized structures, how we call them. In the meantime, we have 19, and the 20th is actually already joining in the row. Uh, it's I from Russia, that also maybe soon want to join us. So many groups have joined, we have become much more inclusive, we have actually tried to work together with people and try actually to expand our, um, our concept and to expand our ideas. Inclusiveness is actually one of the very important features of Organic 3.3. We got tired of conflicts around standard settings and getting lost in details while losing the big picture view. We got tired of losing the ambition and we want to be more system relevant and you want to be relevant in the world. Addressing the global challenges is actually what is our ambition. Uh, loss of biodiversity, hunger, poverty, depletion of natural resources, climate change. These are all the pressing challenges we want to, to be here and we want to take this as a guideline for our strategies. To make the difference in the world, but to make the difference, not to make just the difference inside, is the new way we want to go. So most significantly we talk about Organic 3.0 while thinking about 1.0, which were our pioneers, 2.0s when we went to define, to codify organic agriculture in great details. Now we realize we have to open up and we have to widen the options. To widen the options and put the visions and objectives much more in the foreground. We are not an ISO standard, or not another standard like ISO. We had a, a think tank, which is called SOAN, Sustainable Organic Agriculture Action Network, which prepared a lot, which was thinking a lot, what actually should entail Organic 3.0, what will be actually the content of our future, and they're going to present in less than a month's time uh, six features, six features of Organic 3.0 in Korea, at the expo, uh, in the organic expo actually, not the Italian expo, the organic expo in Korea, just uh, in a few weeks. Once again, after 2011, we stand before an important event of the organic movement. Uh, and again, that event will be in Korea. And again, actually, I from Agro Mediterranean is like a bit like a rehearsal, like a test, like a moment where we we reach out to the movement and see what, how the ideas resonate and actually see what actually is convincing and where we have to go back to our think tanking work. So in that sense, I wish you a great conference, great mo moments to meet, to exchange ideas and, uh, and to celebrate, of course, community and institution. I wish you a great day. So we are getting into the, the center. Thank you for the opening because it's been not just greetings but some inspiration as well and I think that is needed. Uh, we are not worried by the time because we have time. Uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, you, you, Everybody is afraid when I'm moderating because I'm the less moderate of the moderators but uh, anyway, uh, we will cope with it. We have a lot of buffer zone for lunch and breakfast, and breakfast and coffee breaks, <laughs> or second breakfast like the hobbits. Uh, but we are now getting into our principles. I feel we have really our guidance in, for the movement uh, extremely important. And I remember with, with Gunnar and the friends of the World Board, we were in Cuba, <laughs> in Havana, in Santa Clara, defining Havana, and somebody from Vignola, from Spilamberto, came up, <laughs> by the way, and, and gave us a feedback from the, the ground on what we were doing. And uh, the, the whole movement was involved in our visioning of iPhone and the creation, and these uh, principles, that we wanted to put it on stage, I think they are here somewhere, or, yeah, there. Uh, we are following them as a framework for our conference. 
And the first one we choose to start with is ecology. And uh, area, okay, why we are two of us here? Just to give you uh, why, why do we have two moderators? One is speaking English, one is speaking Italian, but it's not that the point. Is that we both, we are in the same cooperative together with Fabio that I think is somewhere there, and others in this Vignola, municipality that was one little sparkle of the organic movement in our region and in our country and I think also in the Mediterranean. And he was, we were working together in the land, in the municipality greens and everything back at uh, more than 25 years ago, 30 years ago. But <laughs> And it's nice that now we are back here and we do it like this jointly. Bye. Present. Right. In the meantime, the regional councillor, Simona Caselli, is here. So thank you very much for being here. Well, I just wanted to acknowledge your presence and thank you. And I would also like to thank the foundation for letting us use uh, this beautiful venue for this conference. And something happened to me last night. I was going home after the presentation of the book Agroecologia. I came across an acquaintance and uh, he asked me, oh, what's happening in Vignola these days? Because he didn't have a clue. So I told him about our event and the nature of this conference. He asked me something apparently banal and trivial, but I think it's not. He asked me, what is this conference for? And I still had in my mind uh, the book presentation in the square, and uh, well, I was still thinking about so many things, climate change, social consequences, I was thinking about campesinos in South America, and by the way, today is 9-11, and uh, we should also think about 9-11-2008, Bolivia, when there was a massacre perpetrated by mafia powers against those who fight for their lands, and uh, dozens of campesinos were murdered and massacred just because they wanted a piece of land to labor. That said, I answered this question as follows, and maybe I gave a too banal qu question, and I said, you open up our minds, and I don't know if uh, he understood what I wanted to say, but unfortunately, I have to realize that since 1990, and even long before that, unfortunately, in our area, organic farming has been neglected, and it's just about uh, using less uh, feature sanitary products. But actually, unfortunately, 25 years after the first conference, and maybe we should do more than that, we open up the discussion about much more important topics like soil fertility issues and so on. And again, we are also talking about the social implications of organic farming. Right, all that to introduce to you a witness. There is his name, he was here 25 years ago. A person who actually doesn't need any introduction, Miguel Altieri. Slow computer, it's my computer. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, grazie.
Thank you very much. Okay, I have 15 minutes for my presentation. I was here 25 years ago twenty five years ago there was the first agri bio mediterranean meeting and yesterday Antonio showed a picture well last night uh, we were talking about um, agroecology, we find that agroecology should be the science on which uh, the true organic agriculture has to be based. So what I'm going to do today is to talk about agroecological principles for an enduring and resilient Mediterranean agriculture. Tutti dormire. Un po' di cappuccino. Okay. I, you know, my father was from Napoli and I showed up to this morning like a, a stupido americano at 9 a.m coming very fast, and then I remember that we're in Italy, huh? Okay. So, agriculture is the simplification of nature. We transform natural ecosystems into monocultures, and when we do that, we lose the biodiversity, and these systems of agriculture require external inputs because they don't have the biodiversity that provides the self-regulatory mechanisms that happens in a forest. The forest doesn't need to be fertilized or, or managed because biodiversity provides all the services for the system to work. Now, small farmers throughout the world have known this uh, in Asia, Latin America, and Africa, like this example from China, where these systems are biodiverse and they don't require inputs. They are very intensive in knowledge. So here we have you know, rice paddies where you have different diversities of, of of rice, a lot of vegetation surrounding the system. You have fish that all, not only provide protein, but also they play very important ecological roles by, for example, controlling weeds, but also controlling the pests that are present in the rice system. Then there's the sponsoring of azola, which is a plant that fixes about 50 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. And then you bring ducks into the system to eat the azola. And then at the end, you end up with a system in which the farmer, all he has to do is to assemble biodiversity, and then that biodiversity, through the interactions, sponsors the function of the system. So they don't require external inputs, not even organic fertilizers, but basically just the functioning of the agroecosystem based on biodiversity. But here in the Mediterranean, we have examples like that. You know, the oasis, for example, from different countries, including Iran and others, uh, the, 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 some of the old systems of olives, where you have all kinds of natural vegetation or fava beans as a cover crop, integration of animals. These systems were all self-sponsored, you know, following the ecological principles of integrating biodiversity, animal and plant species, and then through their interactions, sponsoring the productivity, the fertility, the biological control of the system. But then what happens is that capitalism came, and obviously there was an extreme ecological simplification of the systems, and I'm not surprised that in Puglia we're losing, you know, a lot of the, of the olives because of the attack of Zilela, when you have vulnerable systems that are so genetically homogeneous and not ecologically diverse. And so monocultures may have temporary economic advantage for farmers, but in the long term they do not represent an ecological optimum. And one of the problems that we're facing today is they're highly vulnerable, not only to pests and diseases, but also to climate change. And this is the reason why, for example, being so vulnerable to diseases and pests is that we're having to spray a lot of pesticides and you can see that Europe is leading the way in the world in terms of use of pesticides. And the cost of this, the, the, the ecological footprint of all this technology that is used to subsidize these monocultures has huge cost. It's calculated that the external cost of industrial agriculture is about 208 pounds per hectare 
if you account for the effects of biodiversity loss, human health, disappearing wetlands, erosion, uh, uh, methane uh, uh, emissions, actually uh, greenhouse gases, industrial agriculture uh, contributes with about 30% of greenhouse gases that are affecting the climate today. And interestingly enough, these systems seem to be almost, almost self-destructive because these monocultures are highly vulnerable to climate change. In California right now, we're in the fourth year of a drought and right now we have about half a million hectares that are abandoned because there's no water at a cost of about 1.5 billion in losses in, in dollars. So we need to look for a new agriculture, an agriculture that is decoupled from fossil fuel dependence, an agriculture that is, has low environmental impact, that is resilient to climate change, but also is multifunctional and is the foundation of local food systems because we cannot continue depending on globalized systems where food has to travel about a thousand kilometers on average. And what we're looking for is an agriculture that has a high diversity, a high productivity, and a high efficiency. And the only way you can accomplish that is by having systems that are very high, highly diverse, where you have a high level of recycling, a high level of uh, integration between crops and livestock, and, and, and the low dependence of external inputs that is res the result of this assemblage of biodiversity that sponsors the function of the agroecosystem. So agroecology is based on the one side on this knowledge, millenary knowledge, that is also is exists in the Mediterranean about how to manage agroecosystems, but also with the contributions of ecology and other sciences, some aspects of agricultural sciences like soil biology, biological control are very important. And from that, what we derive is principles. And those principles take different technological forms depending on the social, economic, environmental conditions of each area. And in order for that technology to be relevant to farmers, it has to come through a participatory approach. So the principles of agroecology are five. You know, we have to enhance the recycling of biomass and nutrients. We have to enhance the soil biological activity and the organic matter of the, con of the soil. Minimize the resource losses, minimize the losses of nutrients, water, solar energy, etc. We have to diversify the system at the, at, the lock, at the farm level and at the landscape level. But that diversification has to lead to biological interactions that are going to lead to positive synergisms in the agroecosystem. So as we move from the transformation, the conversion of conventional industrial agriculture towards agroecology, many times, and, and this is a friendly critique to organic agriculture, is that we get stuck in input substitution. 80% of the organic agriculture in California is like this. There are monocultures in which there is an, a, a change of inputs, and basically the systems are highly dependent on external inputs. Here you have farm workers from Mexico, which are farmers in Mexico that were expelled by the free trade agreement, you know, putting biological control agents. In this case, for example, mites, predaceous mites to control pests in, 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 uh, in strawberries. And these systems, yeah, some, some of the organic systems in California and also in Chile, which are Mediterranean regions, depend on 18 to 20 applications of these kinds of stuff into the system, making the system highly um, intensive and costly. And also many of the inputs contradict each other. For example, sulfur applications in, Vigne in Vigneto kills a lot of the beneficial insects. So we need to do a transformation of the system from poly monocultures to more diversified systems. And for that, we have to work at three levels of diversification. Professor Ceccarelli will talk about genetic diversity, the, sp the species diversity, but also the landscape diversity. And this takes the form of strategies. You see, agroecology provides the principles, but then the diversification takes different forms. In, the, in, the, in, the, in, the Lat in Latin American tropics, it could be agroforestry systems. Here, it could be vineyards with cover crops, for example. So there, there are different strategies at the genetic species and landscape level, and one of them is genetic diversity. For example, these are wheat varieties that are mixed together by indigenous people in Chile, the Mapuche Indians in the south of Chile, which is also kind of a semi-Mediterranean area. And you can see here that this genetic diversity is very high, and many uh, plant pathologists have already shown that when you have these mixtures of varieties, you de 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 reduce the, the disease incidence, and Professor Ceccarelli will talk more about that. But also, we have to think about species diversity. For example, broccoli monocultures can be enriched. You know, when you have monoculture, you have very, very, very simple trophic webs. When you diversify the system, then you come up with this type of complex trophic webs, like you see up there, just by putting, for example, 
trigo saraceno, uh, grano saraceno, buckwheat, into the, into the system, and that attracts beneficial insects to control aphids, for example, in broccoli. And then the diversification with flowers. For example, here you can see lettuce that in California farmers are already at, uh, using uh, strips of these flowers, uh, again, um, buckwheat and others, that attract beneficial insects to control pests. Now, this, another principle of agroecology is the enhancement of biomass. Except the example, the most uh, used example in the Mediterranean is the use of cover crops. These cover crops are an important source of uh, the enhanced soil structure, they improve soil fertility, but they also include and enhance the habitat for beneficial insects. So here you can see veg, for example, growing on a vigneto in Chile. And here, when you have this system, you get a very complex interaction between the, the cover crop, the crops, the natural enemies, the pests, the, the, the soil, the weeds, etc. And we can utilize the most positive interactions that happen in the systems. For example, here you can see a vigneto diversified with what buckwheat and also with alisum, which is another plant under the rose, to enhance beneficial insects, but also to enhance soil fertility because the, the buckwheat, the grano saraceno, is a very important source of uh, phosphorus and, and potas potassium. Or in the midst of the summer, you know, when you don't have water, you can use umbelliferae that are, have very deep tap roots that also act uh, to, to improve the structure of the soil, but at the same time can function as a source of beneficial insect without water. At the landscape level, Many times we simplify the landscape to a level that we don't have a, a, a very complex habitat in the systems and therefore the pests thrive. But you can, you can diversify these landscapes by putting corridors or hedgerows as we do. Uh, and then the questions, the scientific questions are, which arrangement is the best? How do you provide this diversity? Around the fields, in the center of the field? And we have studied these questions in Vigneto with, uh, with also our colleague here, Luigi Ponti, who, who was in California for year, four years. So for example, when you surround vineyards with forest, this forest can be a very important source of beneficial insects, but many times the effect only comes to about 30 meters inside the, inside the vineyard. So you have to create corridors that connect to the, uh, to the forest, and then they serve as a circulation of the beneficial insects into the system. Or you can have islands, for example, in this case, uh, that, that act as a push-pull system for, for beneficial insects in the vineyard. The other principle is the principle of uh, strengthening the soil, you know, enhancing soil biology and the structure of the soil, increasing the organic matter. And the principles are very, very well known to everybody. You know, add large quantities of organic materials, use different types of organic materials because they have different contents of different uh, uh, compounds some of them more lignic material, more cellulosic material, and then you have to keep the soil covered with living vegetation or with crop residues. And the soil, the more you enhance the organic matter, obviously you're going to enhance the water holding capacity. Here you can see if you increase the, the percent of organic matter into the soil, the percent of volume of water increases, which is very important for drought, or covering the, the, the systems with mulch, is a very important tool because it increases the infiltration and reduces the evaporation. So here you can see as you increase the thickness of the mulch, you are uh, increasing the infiltration rate in, in, in the system, which is an indication of good soil quality. We have done studies in California with different uh, with beans, fagioli, where you have uh, with, with mulch, without mulch, with the mulch plus organic matter. And just to show the, the extreme there, those beans receive 10 minutes of water every 30 days. And you can see that the best results are when you have organic matter or when you have organic matter plus mulch together. So the, the other principle is to enhance soil biology. When you enhance the soil organic matter, basically what you're doing is enhancing the trophic webs under the soil, very complex trophic webs. Uh, and some of the components of these trophic webs are mycorrhiza, which are very, very important in the in the, in, the, in the nutrition of plants in terms of the use of phosphorus, but also in the water use efficiency, which is again very important in the Mediterranean. But also, you have also a whole network of antagonists, which are organisms, patho uh, microbial uh, organisms that, that act against uh, pathogens. And you can see here, for example, over there, the last example is a, is a soil that is very rich in organic matter with high populations of trichoderma, which is actually an antagonist against diseases, and you can see that it's better than applying fungicides because you activate these uh, trophic webs into the system. The other thing that we're finding 
is that the, the, the resiliency of these agroecosystems, that is the, the resistance and the recovery when climate change comes, is that is linked to the vegetational diversity. The more vegetational diversity you have and the more genetic diversity, the more stable they are. The landscape matrix is also important when you have systems that are surrounded by forests that are more resilient. And also the soil and water matter ma management. On the one side, the organic matter, the soil cover, but also in the, in, in the Mediterranean region, what we have to start doing is water harvesting. There's periods when you have a lot of water and that water has to be stored. So we are engaged in a lot of research today uh, trying to understand which systems are res resilient to climate change and why. So we have done studies in Latin America in eight countries after a hurricane or after a drought, and we're finding that when you study 200 systems in a region, there's three or four that are resistant, that are resilient. And so we're trying to understand the principles that govern that resiliency. And actually the risk that a system has to be susceptible is going to be the relationship between the threat that is the intensity of the threat, the vulnerability, and the reactive capacity. So there isn't much that we can do about this, but we can reduce the vulnerability by enhancing the reactive capacity of the system. And the reactive capacity is linked to the biodiversity, but also linked to the skills and the management and the knowledge of farmers. So here you can see that if we apply, you remember the soil texture triangle? Well, if we use these indicators, because we can use indicators for all of this. I don't have time to go in 15 minutes into the, the methodology, but we have a publication in English that, you can, that we can circulate for you to use. And basically what you find is that you can actually map, let's say we're here in, 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 in Modena, in Bologna, in, in Vignola, and you do a sample of 50 farms, and then you measure the vulnerability, you measure the response capacity, and then you measure, you measure the threat, that is the impact on productivity, for example, the reaction in yields. And then you find there will be systems here, there, there will be systems here that are very, uh, they're very, very less, uh, uh, they're low vulnerability, high response capacity, and very little damage. These are what we call the ecological, agroecological lighthouses. Those are the, the successful agroecological initiatives and what we need to do is through a farmer to farmer network, bring these farmers to learn, not the techniques, but the principles that govern the resilience of these systems. So once you have resilient farms, you have ecologically self-regulated systems via feedback loops, high levels of functional biodiversity, high connectivity, high levels of redundancy, high spatial and temporal heterogeneity, high level of autonomy from external input. These are the principles that govern the resiliency of the systems, and these are the systems that we have to develop based on these principles of resiliency. Now, a lot of work that we're doing in, in, in the Mediterranean, because Chile is part of the Mediterranean, and also uh, California, is with small farmers, because contadini, uh, as I was saying yesterday, they control 20% of the land, but they produce 50 to 70% of the food. So it's a very important approach that we need to take for ensuring food sovereignty. So this is an example of a Mediterranean farm that we did in Chile 25 years ago. This half hectare, and I don't have time to go into the details, it has a very complex rotation, it's surrounded by, by, by fruit trees, it has animals and so on. Basically, uh, if you look at this data in, in Spanish, you can see that the production uh, of the system can feed a family of five, that, but there's a surplus in protein and calo calories, you can see the percentage uh, surplus, and it can actually in, uh, increase the self-sufficiency of food of the family, but also the income of the family, because they don't have to buy any food, and in addition to that, they can sell the surplus, so they can become economically and as well as food uh, sovereign. And we have many, many examples you can see here if, uh, on the left, that would be the, the landscape of the system, a typical Mediterranean system, and here on the right, farmers that were trained on agroecology utilizing these principles, and you can see the conversion of that farm on the right compared to the one on the left, leading to, leading to all of this. And it turns out that Via Campesina, which is the largest peasant movement in the world, and IAB is part of Via Campesina, in their recent declaration, they see agroecology as a key form of resistance to an economic system that puts profit before life and offers us, they say, a collective path forward 
from the multiple crises of climate, food, environmental, public health promoted by the industrial food system. This is an alternative to the, food, to the industrial food system. We cannot you know, use agroecology to um, reform industrial agriculture. This is a transformation tool. It's a political transformation tool that falls within the pillars of food sovereignty that Via Campesina has advanced, where you have land reform, the access to land, to the seeds, to the water, as a central point with agroecological principle, the social movements pushing for this to happen, and the state, which the governments, the local, the national governments have to respond, like in the case of Brazil, where today we have a national law of agroecology with more than $3 billion of budget per year. But in addition to that, as um, a, one of the important sociologists in Wageningen, and nombre, ¿cómo se llama? El, Van der Plau. Thank you, Paulo. Uh, he says that there are food empires that are controlling the food system. They determine what the farmers are going to grow, how much they're going to grow, for whom, with what technology, but also they control what the consumers will eat. You know, how, what quality of food you're going to eat, how much you're going to pay for it, and so on. And what agroecology provides is a bypass where farmers control territories, they control the local markets, and create a bypass to this industrial system. And that's a very, very important key element in the transformation of agriculture, including the Mediterranean. So basically, just to conclude, agroecology provides the principles to create territories that are autonomous. And I think this is a very important concept for the syndaco here, in which you can, if you have the power, I don't know what the power of the communa is, but in the municipalities in Latin America, they're very autonomous and powerful. You can create a territory that is agroecological, and agroecology provides the principles for the food sovereignty but also for the energy sovereignty and the technological sovereignty. Energy because you don't need energy, because you can generate it within the farms. Technological sovereignty because you don't need inputs, not even organic inputs to manage the systems. And all that within a framework of resiliency because climate change is going to be continuing to accelerate in the future. Grazie. Grazie Miguel. Uh, you will be shocked when you go out to Vignola because I remember 25 years ago when you came, you were happy to see conventional farms because they were so mixed and on a small scale and uh, like you were describing. In those 25 years, we had been close to big cities, no, Vignola, modern in Bologna. The cities wanted to eat, actually eat part of our territory. Luckily, we had the resistance of organic farmers, and we have in, this two, in, in our territory, because I appreciate very much your, your point, we have a territory that is overlapping municipalities, not the only one municipality, there are eight municipalities in this valley, and the next valley that is the same, where there is another five that now just merge in one municipality. This is a territory that we have in mind. We have more than 100 organic farms. We have a lot of uh, uh, citizens that they are really creating a local market network. And tonight, we will, you all are invited, we make the inauguration, the opening of the or shop of the organic products from the territory. <laughs> okay, sorry for, but Miguel was already long, so I put something more. Uh, now uh, we have, uh, uh, okay, we have Miguel that started the whole thing of agroecology, and now I'm this very, really pleasure to invite Pablo Titonel, that is, a new star coming up, young and uh, I think that I really believe that we have to cross generation and we have not only to look past, but we need to look in the future and bring our experience, our knowledge to the young people, the younger generation and together because we need the strength of everybody to change this world. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Antonio. Thanks for the invitation. And as you can imagine, it's hard to talk after the professor. So be be kind to me. Um, I wouldn't want to talk about agroecology today because we had an excellent lecture now on what it is, but I want to talk about more uh, how do we get out of the niche that organic agriculture represents uh, worldwide. We know agri agriculture, organic agriculture is really expanding and in terms of sales is increasing at the rate of two digits in many, many countries. The area of organic agriculture in China is already bigger 
than Germany and France together. So everywhere in the world is growing. In many places, alongside with agroecology, in others not, as, as Miguel showed before, but it's still a niche, and we need to get out of that niche. So, of course, there are many differences in, in, in terms of agroecology and organic agriculture, but let's concentrate on things which are in common. The first one is that agroecology can actually provide the principles for a sustainable forms of organic agriculture, and that most organic farmers actually are using principles of, of uh, agroecology. And those principles were actually largely explained, explained by, by Miguel already. Now, a bit of history, agroecology started as a, as a scientific discipline many years ago, and then it turned into a practice, a set of practices. Farmers started doing this, and then it became uh, a, sci a, a movement, a social movement, uh, and many of you are, are, are part of that movement. And I think if we, if we look at this history, I hope that from now on, we're going to have a third line, which is the line of institutionalization of agroecology. Not in the sense of, you know, creating a big agroecology centers, but how do we influence policies? How do we influence the way research is done? How do we influence markets in order to create conducive conditions for agroecology to expand? Now, agroecology, some of those institutions are there, and one of those is the SOCLA, the Latin American Society for Agroecology, which is obviously a Latin American society, was funded by Miguel, but it's also looking at global problems, like for instance, in this case, with this contribution to the Rio Summit. Many large organizations of research, like INRA in France or INTA in Argentina, are taking up agri agroecology very seriously and trying to see how do we implement it? What do we do with it? How do we reform our programs in order to include this? And of course, there's lots of debates and lots of uh, you know, miles to be, to be covered yet, but there's very good political intention there. And obviously, the, one of the strongest organizations and institutions around agroecology is La Via Campesina, which is really growing worldwide. Now, when we look at farmers, especially farmers in Europe, and as you know, I was, until two months ago, a professor in the Netherlands, in, in Wageningen University. We see these farmers who are organic farmers, who are very innovative, who are not necessarily managing small farms, who are using the newest knowledge and technology, and who are able to produce 10 tons of wheat per hectare organically, right? And, and these farmers are real innovators, right? And they may not know, may never have, have heard about agroecology necessarily, right? But this farmer in particular, is a farmer who is farming on 80 hectares of land and has 18 different crops on his land. So that's what I'm saying. Farmers are diversifying and using principles of agroecology. For instance, he experiments with cover crops himself. He tries different things. He always has an experiment going on, et cetera, et cetera. He adapts management in order, in order to actually increase yields under organic, under organic management. All this knowledge and all this innovation unfortunately is, is scattered in these situations because farmers are not necessarily nucleated in an institution that can actually bring that together. Other examples also from the Netherlands, this is a farmer, very young farmer, which is something very rare to find in many places in Europe, young farmers. And this young farmer, and I normally take my students there because he's using cover crops with lots of diversity in, on his farm. And one of the exercises that we do on, the, on that farm is that students have to find the different seeds of the cover crop and recognize the species. Isn't it, Carlo? Or you, you actually, you didn't, you have to also. I'm sorry for this. Um, another example comes from, from a Mediterranean region, from the Camargue, from the south of France. And there also, there are, it is an area where you have a, a lake, which is a very important wetland for migratory birds that go from Europe to Africa. That's a, that's a UNESCO site, that's a very, very well recognized uh, Ransat site as well. And there is a lot of rice production. It's, that's where France produces rice. It's at the, uh, in the delta of the Rhone River. And in that region, there is a lot of, obviously, support for organic agriculture because of, of the impact that conventional agriculture can have on nature. And farmers have been also innovating doing lots of things to actually adapt their systems, using diversity, and luckily there was, a, there was some monitoring done on about 380 fields in that region for a number of years, and then we had the chance to actually be invited to, to look at that, 
uh, that, that those monitor uh, to see, to look at the performance of these systems, this, this uh, organic versus the conversion, conversion of wells of producing rice. And what we've noticed first is that, that farmers, uh, organic farmers were actually planting later and they would have greater biomass of weeds at the end of the season, but the yields would not be necessarily so, so different. And in fact, analyzing those, those data and looking at how farmers do, do make decisions and discussing with farmers the results, we came out to realize that farmers have, have both conventional and organic farmers had rice, but it was completely different rice systems. They were managing it with a totally different logic, right? And this, this is also knowledge that is not necessarily um, available to be, to be uh, um, disseminated because of this lack of institutions around this. Now, agroforestry is another example, which is also very important for, for the Mediterranean region, especially the regions with, with the water deficit. And how would agroforestry, uh, agroforestry look like in Europe? Well, you'd be surprised to see, to realize, or maybe not when you, when you are from Italy, that there is all kinds of forms already existing of, of agroforestry. And a couple of years ago, there was this book which was very interesting about agroforestry systems in Europe. And and then it's the future, and then there's the, the students. And the, well, can we imagine a, a Dutch dairy farm with agroforestry? Well, why not? I mean, this is work done by our students, designing towards the future, imagining, dreaming, if you want. But this is feasible. And some farmers are already doing that. Now, having diversity on the, on the farm is, has a number of, of, of regulatory uh, benefits, but not only for plants and for natural enemies, also for animal production, for animal health. In this particular case, in the Netherlands, we often see that animals, when they see a little bit of, a, of a, an area with diversity, with herbs, animals go and graze there, right? Although they have very nice grasslands with dry grass, very productive, etc., etc. Now, we follow 30 different farms in the Netherlands, in different places, some of them organic, some of them conventional, some of them biodynamic, and we classify the grasslands they had based on the composition, the botanical composition and the presence of herbs. And we look at the herbs, but we also look at their medicinal properties. So based on presence and based on medicinal properties, we gave an index to each of those grasslands, you know, how, how rich they were in medicinal herbs. And we monitored 30 farms over a season, and we observed that the more diversity in the grassland, the less need for antibiotics during lactation of animals. right? And of course, this is a regression, this is an empirical result, but this is a very promising avenue to understand now what are those drivers, what actually explains this, this trend that we observe. And when, when we select farmers, actually by phoning farmers, and actually, well, can you recommend an excellent farmer? And then we come up with 10, the 10 most excellent farmers in the Netherlands. We see them, all of them agree that low antibiotic use is not just the result of a one single management measure, but it's a is the result of a, an integrative management on the farm. So all of this, all of this evidence tells us that agroecology requires innovative design, it requires landscape approaches, it requires farmers' knowledge to be incorporated, and it requires this, this dialogue of wisdom between farmers' knowledge and also scientific knowledge, and social organizations and movements to actually support the model. But how do we get out of, of the niche again? And for that, I'm going to use uh, some graphs, which are a bit like complex, perhaps, but uh, I'll try to explain them uh, very, very quickly. These are used in these are used by scientists, by social scientists, who, under, who try to understand and explain trajectories and explain transitions in society. And for instance, uh, people talk about social technical regimes, regimes in which things are happening, the markets, habits, consumption, etc., and every now and then there is an opening for a new innovation, what they call a niche innovation. Right? So those openings are there, and those openings happen because there is also a social, a slowly evolving social technical landscape, right? And that social technical landscape generates openings every now and then in the regime, and that allows these niches to be taken up. Right? We can have lots of niche innovations, but if there is no opening in the regime, 
there's not going to be any adoption of those innovations, right? So when those innovations are down here, they're not allowed to enter the regime, we normally say that they are locked in, right? So in a way, organic agriculture is locked in by well, many of the factors that we, that we all know at an international level. Nowadays, we're in a situation in which we have, and of course there are feedbacks, no? we have a very turbulent landscape, social technical landscape, which is determined by demographic processes, is determined by migration, is determined by climate change, food, food security, um, emerging economies. There's lots of opportunities and lots of openings, and we need to capture that opportunity in a way. We're in a very good moment for that. And one way to actually support that is to generate system innovation programs. Let me show you one example. As you may know, I'm, I joined INTA, uh, a National Research Organization of Argentina, two months ago. And in INTA, we're trying to develop the Red, the Agroecology Network, Red de Agroecología, Agroecology Network within the institution because there is a, a strong political will to actually have agroecology in the agenda, but they, they don't know how, we don't know how, right? But we start from a network, and that network brings together the current structure of INTA, which is research institute, extension agency, national programs, et cetera, et cetera, and the network is at the center. So we didn't create a national program on agroecology, because that would be like isolating it, putting it in one corner, which is create a network that relates all these other elements of the institution. And of course, that also fosters integration with other elements outside the institution, which is what the most important thing. And, and as I said, this is work in progress. Right? We don't know if this is successful or not, but this is what we're trying at the, at the moment. Let me show you some, some examples of, of the approach. The approach is, is called the co-innovation approach, and there's very good experience, especially in Uruguay. Uh, in Uruguay, people have been working uh, under this paradigm, the idea of complex systems, the idea of dynamic project monitoring and social learning setting, and that's, those are the three pillars, the three elements that, that define co-innovation. And basically, when, it, when we take it to the practice, for instance, in this particular case, it was a problem with vegetable growers, family vegetable growers in Uruguay, with lots of soil degradation, abandonment of land, poor irrigation efficiency, all kinds of problems. And the project actually started with uh, participatory diagnosis of the problem, and these little loops there, they represent the frequency of iteration between technical people and, and the farmers. So there were farmers and researchers and extension agents that were meeting very regularly every 15 days to actually redesign and implement and evaluate. That's why we call this dynamic project monitoring, right? And next to this, there was another another group of people who were looking like Big Brother at that process and trying to understand how it was and trying to evaluate the process of interaction and inform the actors of that process in order to correct or adapt to, 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 to move towards progress. So what is interesting here, if you have worked on development projects, you know that many of the alternatives that we propose to farmers are very, very good, but then when the project stops, everything stops, right? Farmers abandoned in many cases of what we do. Well, in this particular case, six years after the project, you still see these rates of adoption. So you see, the technologies that were proposed to farmers were not really rocket science, right? Normal technologies. But the, what is interesting is the high rate of adoption six years after the project. So now, the government of Uruguay is using this as a platform to develop their new extension systems. And in the Netherlands, we, we started to, we tried to adapt this system because obviously, obviously the, the, in the Netherlands, we don't have such a thing as, an, as a national uh, research organization or extension service. The extension services are private. Uh, we are, well, it's, it's a different situation. Farmers are, uh, are of a decent idiosyncrasy, but we try to do something similar. And we, we actually ask farmers to help us design alternative systems. And farmers came, and in interaction with them, we did, well, and using the latest knowledge and technology also because that's very attractive to farmers, using drones and all those kinds of things. Uh, you're not very attractive, really. Uh, we designed these systems, these strip cropping systems, in which we basically had, uh, well, the control fields 
all organic, right? All organic, no, there's no conventional here. The control fields, the strip cropping, so narrow strips, the width of a, of a combined machine so farmers can mechanize it, but still strips. And then another one which was strips and crop mixing within the strips. Right? And we have excellent students like, like Carlos, so they, they do all kinds of research on those strips and they see a lot of benefits, for instance, much more uh, natural enemy abundance when you have strips and mixing crops, better yields, better yields of potatoes in a mix as compared to potatoes alone. I remember that when once Miguel came to Aachen and we went to visit a potato farmer, and Miguel was telling him, well, you have to mix varieties, right? He was right, look, if you mix varieties, you get better yields. But the potato farmer was saying, well, but I, I have one buyer, the industry, who wants all my potatoes to look the same, the same size, the same color, et cetera, et cetera, so I can't mix varieties. And, well, all kinds of, of, of advantages of this. And then, of course, we, we were also known because we were one of the few groups that would take farmers to the classroom and, and then discuss with them some of the things. So that was, that was an, interesting, an interesting process, and it's, it's an ongoing one. But now we're trying to, to bring it broader in Europe, but we are, uh, I was because I, I left already, but we, we got a project from the European Union to do, to, to replicate similar innovation platforms, that's how we call them, in different parts of Europe with different partners. Right? Good. Now, sometimes that, that, that was a kind of a planified transition. I mean, we, we're doing, we're trying to implement a transition together with farmers. Sometimes transitions, come out of opportunities. Right? In this particular case, it's, a, it's the case of, uh, of people who, colleagues from INTA who were not, not able to come today, but they asked me to, to present it for them. And they, they've been working with, with farmers and with local populations uh, on the issue of spraying pesticides close to where people live, right? So in many places in Argentina, what happens is that there is a law by which uh, farmers are not allowed to spray pesticides close to where people live, and the width of that area free of pesticides depends on the municipality or, or on the provinces or something like that. In this particular case, San Gennaro, Santa Fe, one of the provinces of Argentina, if that, that red area represents a farm, and that farmer is not allowed to use pesticides on that strip after the yellow line, right? So, of course, you would say that's, that's good, right? But I mean, the farmer also has to make a living. This is not necessarily a big farm, a wealthy farm, a big, you know. Uh, this is a farmer who lives there. Uh, in Argentina, it's agriculture without subsidies, so it's a, a farmer with 50 hectare, 100 hectare. It's a small farm. And this farmer also has a problem. And what, what happens is that normally, farmers end up selling that part of the land, and that becomes urban, and the problem only grows, right? So what alternatives are there? Well, the alternative, is agroecology. How do we manage those boundaries? Even the government, the local government, is saying, we think about San Gennaro, that's the name of the place, as, a, as an agroecological city, right? So that's very, they, they may not necessarily know very well what it means, but it opens a huge opportunity for us to, to, to go and develop agroecology. So, so that's what this group of people have been doing, interacting with the local population, interacting with the local government to develop systems. And, but then to say, well, What's the principle that we're going to follow to develop these systems? It's the idea of participatory learning and action research. They say, first of all, autonomy, right? In terms of energy, economics, knowledge, it has to come from the area. Minimum risk, so minimize the risk, but also the economic risk for everyone. Diversity, don't just find their silver bullets, just find a diversity of options, so farmers can also have, have, uh, have more maneuver and use local resources. You can bring local knowledge from outside, but if you make the systems depend on external resources, then you, you haven't really solved the problem, right? So I thought this was interesting to reflect because it opens opportunities for agroecology. Now, going back to, to what Miguel was, was saying, this idea of transitions, well actually, we need a lot of technological development, technological innovations, to foster transi transitions towards agroecological landscape, but we also need a lot of institutional innovation, right? So if we want to move from current systems to agroecological landscape in the future, 
Well, obviously, in different parts of the world, the trajectory will follow different ways, right? Perhaps starting from institutional and then technical, perhaps the other way around, or being meandro, we don't know, right? What we do know is what, what, is what Miguel was telling us before. There's gonna be a bottleneck, and that bottleneck is often called the input substitution trap, right? Now, what are the incentives, what are the drivers towards this transition? Well, the driver that is supported by international community or by many of the national institutes is optimization. For instance, the eco-efficiency, climate smart agriculture, sustainable intensification, sustainable development goals, all that is different forms of the same discourse, which is optimization. Optimize existing systems without necessarily challenging them, without necessarily changing them, just optimize them, right? With good intentions, but it's not enough. If we move now to other drivers like consumer drives, consumers want to eat without pesticides, or consumers, or regulations, which could be government regulations or certification system, which is also a form of regulation. Well, that can take you as far as the input substitution phase. Right? If you really want to move forward, forward, then we need the co-evolution of social movements, and we need territorial development. Either with one municipality or eight municipalities, I don't know, that is institutional engineering, but we need institutional development at the territorial level, right? And this is a critical vulnerability zone, right? Many of the farmers, many of the organic farmers who are there in the input substitution phase, they're not there by choice. They're there because they, are, they want to move forward, but they don't have the conducive conditions to do so. Right? And of course, this needs also policy innovations, right? And when it comes to policies, we always very often think about, about steak, but a carrot is also is more gentle and it can also be more, into, more motivating to, to farmers. But we should not forget, if we look towards the future, that there are two elements that we need to take very seriously into account. The first one is that farmers are getting old. Everywhere in the world, farmers are getting old, and especially in Europe. And the second one is that there is a huge influence of of the value chain, and this concentration is going on. Right? This is not the past. This is present, and it's going to get worse and worse, or so it seems, towards the future. So when you think about transitions, transitions towards agroecology, towards organic 3.0, we need to think about three elements. The first one is to challenge the current system, and that we know how to do, and especially, well, we know, or we know more or less, but we need science, we need activism, we need to challenge the system. Convince people that it's no longer viable. The second one is to provide proof that the alternative works. We need to, we know that, but we need to improve a little bit more there, right? And the third one, and this is the more, the more difficult one, is work towards convergence. Right? In a way, we need to find, and you have to be really careful here, because conversion doesn't mean that we're going to be, we have to be uh, eaten up by, by multinationals or anything like that. But we need to work towards conversions because it's hard for, for most farmers to actually transform their systems when they have debt, when they are farming on land that costs 80,000 euros a hectare. It's, it's, it's hard for them to actually move. If you really want them to embrace them, to let them transition, then we need, also need to find ways of working towards conversions. Thank you very much. So, um, the immoderate moderator decided that we will not have any questions, but we go on straight away with Salvatore Ciaccarelli. Just to finish what we, and getting into the point that we, 25 years ago, maybe 30, we started farmers cooperatives or young people cooperatives, organic, and we were the second generation that were out of the farming because most of the conventional farmers were not even interested in thinking about the organic. I think now the provocation of uh, having new generation going to the land is a needed thing. We have also a lot of 
situation where I was telling you speculation. Now speculation is not happening anymore because nobody is building anymore, at least in countries like here where we have cri economic crisis. Those land, that they were agricultural land, fertile land, became uh, city land, but now nobody is building. So they want to go back agriculture. But we should get them back in agriculture, but for young people or unemployed people to start doing organic and to do agroecological approaches for feeding the local territories. And I think this is feasible. We need just a political will, and uh, we have the revolution at end. Well, I will speak Italian so that interpreters will switch to translation into English. I'm the last speaker of the first batch of presentations. Well, I hope not to be the last straw, as English speakers say. Well, why the seeds of the future? Well, because in the future, we will have to face several challenges, water, climate change, biodiversity, hunger, and malnutrition poverty and so I think that maybe because I'm old maybe because of my profession I think that the seeds are at the very heart of everything when we talk about seeds actually we talk about food because food comes from seeds and when you talk about seeds and foods you talk about health so if you control the seeds actually you control health well, I won't elaborate too much on these five macro problems because much is being said about them. I just want to say a couple of things that are not very often heard. And about climate change, it is something that is not very well mentioned. And it is the following. No one is, is a, a sort of cancer foresee the climate in Vignola in 20 years time, how much hotter, how much drier, when, how, if yes, if not. So nobody knows, nobody is a clairvoyant. Another important effect of climate change, and nobody talks about it, is the impact on human health. Well, studies were published showing that the CO2 increase will reduce the zinc and iron content in the mostly co consumed plants and uh, today 63 million people in the world die because of sort of the lack of iron, iron deficiency. So scientific community is very important and scientific community keeps telling us that biodiversity is the key to food security and on the other hand there is another science, the one that produces uses uh, food uh, tells us that over the last 30 years uh, genetic manipulation has uh, taken the way of uniformity. So today, any variety should be sort of uh, uniform, stable, and distinct. And as you well understand, uh, this is clear that uh, genetic engineers try to adapt to plants and species to climate change. So there is uh, an oligopoly in the seeds market and in seeds uh, uh, sort of marketing. And this poses a threat on the food world because on the one hand farmers have limited choice when buying seeds but also they have limited choice when it comes to growing crops and because what they grow ends up uh, on our table so actually the range of variety has diminished 60% of calories comes from maize, wheat and rice the three main species absorbing the most water and are not even the most nutrient so these are sort of reduction in the variety of food starts having an impact on our sort of uh, gut flora because uh, this lack of diversity reduces problem, sort of reduces our uh, gut flora and uh, increases many kinds of diseases like asthma and some cancers. So this relation is uh, also shown in the fact that there is an illegal poly in the pesticide market. So those who sell seeds also sell very often pesticides. So 
Why should I sort of sell seed and do not require pesticide if I also sell pesticide? So again, you know that genetically modified organism and EU in Italy said it on the Republica, some four things on that. But you know that actually the use of pesticide did not increase, there was Sorry, there was an increase in volume, and so it did not diminish. So the use of pesticide went not down. And uh, GMOs cannot be the solution because they ignore the fundamental theorem of natural selection. What does it say? It says that if you change the landscape, the environment around the living organism, and the fungi bringing more diseases to insects uh, and the pests and the, sorry the pests are living organisms so if you change that environment then living organisms try to adapt and fit the new environment so if you introduce a new GMO in the environment means that you modify the environment as a whole as a matter of fact there has there have been articles on that on important scientific publications showing to what extent organisms react to the introduction of GMOs becoming resistant. One of the most well-known cases is the case of GM cotton resistant to Roundup in 04, the first plants resistant to Roundup were seen in 2012, 92% of farmers in Georgia hand weeded 54% of GM cotton. Well, this is not said by Mario Capanna, this is not said by Vandana Shiva, but the Cotton Society of America. Well, if we time travel, as you know, agriculture was born in Mesopotamia, and for 9,000 years, there was a a great accumulation of knowledge and know-how, as Miguel and Pablo said. And all that knowledge resulted in the genetic improvement process made by farmers, made differently by engineers. And this had a specific feature. Selection was made through specific adaptation to a specific place, to a specific soil, and to for a specific use. So it was normal that if the same plant was used for different uses, then farmers would use different varieties. So that led to that wide range of diversity mentioned by Miguel last night. And because these varieties were not genetically uniform, well, there was a lot of resilience, both at farm level, but also at global level, because, I mean, the where such uh, varieties were all different from one another. But when genetic improvement started to be done scientifically, well, what until then had been done by thousands of farmers in thousands of different places with thousands of different species started to be done by few people including people like me, because I've been doing this for many years, and that brought about a radical philosophy change. Because it's quite clear, if you are in an experimental station, you do not make up varieties for that, you make it for the outside world, but the outside world is very different from your lab. So it's much better to make a variety that is the same for everybody. But the outside world is not the same everywhere, so actually, then uh, you will have more fertile lands, less fertile lands. You will have lands with more insects, fewer insects. And so people will tend to use more or less pesticides. And so that was the philosophy of the Green Revolution. So finding a one-size-fits-all solution. And so if there were too many factors, well, these factors were standardized and flattened out by offering the same variety to everybody in the world, a problemless variety. 
In 1995, uh, I used to work in this sector, and I saw that uh, the very same science that was at the basis of the Green Revolution can be used differently to bring back biodiversity in agriculture. We can do so by transporting all the, the genetic modification uh, to the fields of a farmer, merging on the one hand the technical knowledge of a scientist and on the other hand, hands-on experience accumulated by farmers in order to make the most of both worlds. And most of all, you can replicate this process in, uh, well, as many places of the world as you can do. So this is something I proposed to do in Syria when I collaborated through the ministry. I remember that uh, we were in 34 villages, uh, the red dots that you see here. In blue, you see the experimental stations at the ministry for agriculture, I worked where the yellow dot is, so uh, 30 kilometers south of Aleppo. So the difference with the mainstream method is that uh, each one out of those 24 villages was considered as an independent selection unit. That means that farmers could decide independently what was best for that place, regardless of how that variety would behave in other villages. So you can well imagine that the uh, diversity boom that was brought about by this process. So together with other scientists, we did that with several species, pulses, cereals, grains, industrial plants, greeneries, root plants, so just to show that species are never an obstacle. And we did it in Ethiopia, in Yemen, in dry areas of Syria, in Jordan, in Iran, in Argentina, Ethiopia, recently in Uganda, and also in Italy with tomatoes in organic farming conditions. I want to say a few words on that because uh, Mr. Campanelli is one of the supporters and in 2010 he made some crossbreeds and then the F1 was developed and for the F2, F3 and F4, they were grown in the farmer's fields and they made a selection. If you see the last chart of the best sort of result, the best line selected by farmers had a great yield higher than the commercial hybrid in two different small orders, but not in the experimental station. That means that if we were to do this all the work in the lab, we would have never identified the successful and very profitable and fruitful line. So if you shift from the mainstream approach to the participatory approach, it is considered impossible by many scientists. By others, it is considered as dangerous. Others consider that this is a too long process to be carried out. Others consider that too efforts taking and too complicated, and others simply want to see the light at the end of the tunnel. But nevertheless, around 07-08, the process showed some weaknesses. And uh, the main problem beyond the level of collaboration is that scientists and institutions seem not to be very much keen. They are not very much in favor of this kind of collaboration with farmers. And uh, so sometimes uh, they seem to be in favor, sometimes they are not. So if uh, research institutes stop collaborating, where can people get that information that is needed also by farmers to make the best selection. So that is why in 08 I decided to go back to an old idea that had been published by an American researcher in the 50s that is about uh, the genetic improvement based on evolution, the evolutionary breeding. And again, this was the result of some draft experiences in the 20s and 30s and then 
they were also further studies uh, by Robert Allard. And they showed in those years the great advantage of breeding and of mixing up. So the evolutionary plant breeding means uh, so giving a farmer a mix of uh, as many things as you want, as, as many as you can mix up. So these mixes can be planted also in very hard places. I also put the organic farming because there are not many evolutionary breeding programs for this kind of farming. So you sow and harvest, you sow and harvest, you sow and harvest. And, harvest. and these mixes are also naturally made. So the seed that you harvest is never the same, is never identical from a genetic point of view from the one that you saw. So the mix evolves and improves and uh, it tries to become always better, to fit always better to a specific soil, to a specific climate, to a specific farming methodology, the one used by the involved farmers. So do you remember what I say when I said that one of the aspects of climate change is that we do not know now how climate will change and evolve in 20 years time. So when you invest millions of dollars in research programs to improve the genetics, to adapt to climate change, but to what are you adapting? Plus two degrees, minus two degrees, uh, more rainfall, less rainfall, which climate? But these mixes evolve over 20, 30 years time gradually and do not need to know now how climate change is going to evolve because this is a gradual process. They recombine constantly, they remix up constantly, and so they have the natural time to naturally adapt. All that may be the starting point for a participatory program because starting from those mixes, you can make selections that can end up in new varieties. I started doing that in 2008. I used to work in Syria then, and I was in charge of a genetic uh, bio-improvement program, and uh, we mixed up uh, uh, different kinds of barley, but then uh, some uh, decided to make me change. I studied and I worked on durum wheat. Here you see some examples of these mixes of durum wheat plants. So imagine that in this field, no there are, I mean, uh, there are not two plants that are genetically identical. And then I did the same in Ethiopia, and then in Jordan, the same was done without a specific program for wheat and barley. This is Iran, and this approach was tested and is quite successful. It's a sort of broadening up, and it is largely adopted in many provinces of Iran. There we started with wheat and barley, now we are moving to rice and corn. Well, all that arrived in Italy in 0910, thanks to Ayub, and the mixes of barley and wheat are grown in many provinces recently. I started also in Sardinia, and thanks to the CREA Institute of Mont San Polo, we started with zucchini, tomato, and then with a corn in a group in the north, and always uh, with beans in Mont San Polo and salad, leafy salad. This is the Population, evolutionary population grown in Sicily, and Giuseppe Lierosi knows that. So, this is something they did. This is the zucchini population grown now by an organic farmer on the Adriatic coast, and actually, he can make out a living out of this zucchini. So, this is a sort of profitable. This can become a commercial product. So, the evolutionary population evolves, and so this is always captured a small parcel of the land, of the field, but at specific intervals decided by the farmer can decide to make selections at any time, and this is what we're doing in Jordan, and these varieties are being tested this year. So, which future? If research institutes do not support specific breeding programs, well, these evolutionary populations can replace those programs, guaranteeing a constant flow of materials that is always new.
Well, this is what we thought until a couple of years ago, and that in Iran something very interesting happened. Well, a local researcher, so my barley mixer, the one created in 08, he made a new one with Iran barley varieties, and he did it in Iran. He gave it to farmers, and farmers started to make bread out of it. And a cooperative was established, led by women, and this bread was so successful commercially that was uh, unexpected and uh, short after the marketing of this bread so customers started calling in and saying what did you put in that bread because since we eat it people who had bowels problems allergies started to feel better and in the case of Iran, not only these mixes showed a better yield and better profitability, better control on pests, better control on uh, diseases carried around by insects. So the same ecology principles applied to farming, and they showed that cultivating diversity can be economically successful. We have repeated that in the Marches region, where I have a celiac sort of relative, and uh, this is being tested, and the products are being sold in some tourist farms. So, the evolutionary plant breeding, first of all, brings about results that increases food sovereignty. So seeds become once again the property of farmers. It reduces vulnerability of crops, creating new diversity. So these mixes are sorts of uh, very good barriers against uh, insects and pests. And also they are cheap. They are cheap, a cheap tool to make crops adapt to climate change. And they cannot be patented. So even if somebody comes up and steal a mix, after a few years, that mix will be different in the stealer's hands. So it's not possible to pattern them, to crystallize and them. So this strategy would allow us to combine the two strategies people always talk about adaptation and mitigation, because one is typical of organic farming and agroecology, and the other one, it uh, is supported by genetic improvement made by man. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, the immoderate moderator disappeared, so it's time for coffee break. Let's take advantage of his absence. Coffee break. Thank you. So, coffee break uh, will last 20 minutes. Thank you. 20 minutes. <laughs>